Welcome to a lecture on scattering from discrete objects and surfaces. The initial scenario we would like to consider here is one which we're scattering from a discrete object. This discrete object is indicated as Q in this diagram. It's being illuminated by an antenna system with directivity G sub t. Power P sub t is being applied and the object is at a distance of r sub i in the direction r hat sub i. The receiving system is receiving a power p sub r, which is what we're trying to determine. The directivity of the receive antenna system is g sub r. And the vector pointing from the scattering object to the receiving antenna is r hat sub s, times r sub s. So r sub i and r sub s are the distances from the transmitter and receiver respectively. In this scenario there is no direct transfer of power between the transmitter and the receiver. So we're not considering power which goes directly from transmitter to receiver, only power which is scattered by the object Q. It's fairly straightforward to figure out what this received power should be. The analysis goes as follows. First, we determine the power density incident on Q. The power density, which is incident on Q due to the transmitter, is simply the transmit power divided by the area of a sphere having radius equal to the distance to the scattering object. So 4 pi or r sub i squared. That gives you the power density that an isotropic antenna would deliver to Q, but since we have an antenna with directivity g sub t, we multiply by g sub t. That gives us the power density incident on Q, a quantity having units of watts per meter squared. Next, we determine the power which is redirected towards the receiver, but still at Q. And to do that, we'll simply multiply by some factor, which we'll call sigma. And sigma is going to depend on the directions from the transmitter and to the receiver, respectively. We'll come back to that in a moment. But since this quantity sigma multiplied by the incident power density is giving us power, something having units of watts, we see that this is going to have units of meters squared. Next, we determine the power density incident on the receiver. So this is the power which is now traveled from the scatterer to the receiver. We simply divide by 4 pi r sub s squared. That is the area of a sphere having radius equal to the distance. And that gives us the power density incident on the receiver, which is watts per meter squared. The rest of the analysis is straightforward. We simply multiply by the effective aperture of the receiver. Uh, that we can determine in terms of the directivity simply by the expression lambda squared, that's wavelength squared, divided by 4 pi times directivity. So multiplying all that up, we get the received power. Now the one part of this which is new is this quantity sigma. Sigma describes the scattering properties of Q. So this is the thing which is capturing the way in which Q is redirecting the power which is incident upon it. And as we previously determined, it must have units of area, that is meters squared. But note, this is not literally area. We're not saying that this object Q has an area, a surface area of so many meters squared. We are simply saying that the units of this scattering coefficient sigma has units of meters squared. The common name for this coefficient is bistatic radar cross-section, or simply RCS. So sigma is RCS. We put this all together and we get the expression indicated in the orange box here, that the received power is of course proportional to the transmit power, of course proportional to the directivity of the transmitter, of course proportional to the directivity of the receiver, we have a lambda squared, we have a 1 over 4 pi cubed, we have the RCS, and then the range from transmitter to Q squared, and the range from Q to the receiver squared.
And this is known as the bi-static radar range equation. Note that this part can be interpreted as a path gain or inverse path loss. In other words, this whole thing looks like Freeze equation, which you may be familiar with from uh, analysis of communication systems. In other words, Freeze equation says that received power is equal to transmit power times transmit directivity times received directivity times path gain, one over path loss. So here, this is evidently path gain, one over path loss, in the scenario where we are scattering from Q. So this is a modified version of the freeze equation. For a free space path that is no Q, but having the same length, R sub I plus R sub S, the free space freeze equation would be P sub T, G sub T, G sub R, lambda squared again, four pi squared, but note this is squared and not cubed, and then the range dependence is simply the sum of those distances squared. So this is what we get from the free space freeze equation for a path which has the same overall path length, but not scattering. Now the reason I like to point this out is because there is a significant difference in the range dependence. Up here, the range dependence is R sub I squared, R sub S squared. Here, the range dependence is R sub I plus R sub S quantity squared. So not only are we talking about multiplication and addition, but we are talking about this exponent here being squared and this overall exponent up here being the fourth power. So there's a significant difference in the way path loss works in these two scenarios. Finally, before moving on, an important warning here. The above theory is valid only if the dimensions of the scattering object are small compared to the ranges R sub i and R sub s. This is required because otherwise we would have a continuum of RCS coefficients and not just one discrete value. So if we had a larger object or an object whose dimensions were comparable to those ranges, we would have to consider a whole continuum of scattering coefficients because there would be many ways in which the instant power could scatter from the object. Whereas if the object is far from the antenna, there's really just one geometry that we have to consider. So this is important to keep in mind. The theory is only valid if the dimensions of Q are small compared to the ranges. Lots of faulty conclusions can be traced back to this error, to cases where this range equation is applied in conditions in which it is not valid. For some additional insight, we'd like to consider the special case of monostatic scatter. Monostatic simply means that the receiver and the transmitter are located the same place so that we have this relationship between the transmitted and received directions and ranges. Then we write the RCS as something which depends only on R sub I, and uh, we can indicate that in shorthand as sigma sub m, meaning the monostatic RCS. In this case, we see that the overall bistatic radar cross-section reduces to something simpler. It's transmit power times directivity squared, because transmit and receive directivity are equal. Lambda squared again, 1 over 4 pi cubed again, the monostatic RCS, and then simply 1 over R to the 4, where we're using the capital R to represent either R sub I or R sub S, which are equal. So now we explicitly see R to the 4th in the denominator. And this is referred to as the monostatic radar range equation. Now the reason I've gone to the effort to show this is because there is one scenario where the monostatic radar cross-section is known exactly. So we can study what actually happens in this problem. And that case where we know it exactly is broadside scattering from a perfectly conducting plate. 
So if you have a perfectly conducting plate having area A and the direction from which you illuminate it is perpendicular to the plate, that is normal to the plate, then it is known that the monostatic radar cross-section is simply 4 pi times area squared divided by wavelength squared. Very simple relationship. In this case, the received power becomes transmit power times directivity squared, wavelength squared divided by 4 pi cubed, but we have 4 pi times area squared divided by wavelength squared in the numerator and r to the fourth in the denominator. So there's a whole bunch of cancellation and we end up with transmit power times directivity squared times area squared divided by 4 pi quantity squared divided by range to the fourth. And we can once again put this in the form of Fries equation. Transmit power times transmit directivity times received directivity and then what's left over is the path gain, or 1 over the path loss. So in the case of monostatic scattering from a flat plate at broadside incidence, we find that the path gain, that is reciprocal path loss, is A, the area, divided by 4 pi range squared, quantity squared. Now it's interesting to compare this to the free space, that is no scattering case, where we have equal path length, that is 2r, and in that case, the free space freeze equation would say that the path gain is lambda over 4 pi times 2 times r quantity squared. So we see once again that we have a very different thing going on here because in this case, the path gain is going as 1 over r squared, but in this case, the path gain is going as 1 over r to the fourth. Furthermore, we see that in the case of scattering, the result is independent of frequency. Note here, there is no wavelength factor, whereas here, the result depends on wavelength. This is also a good place to point out a common misconception, that is that the monostatic radar cross-section somehow goes to infinity as area goes to infinity. This statement is false. When the area of the plate goes to infinity, the monostatic radar cross-section is actually undefined. And this is because if the area goes to infinity, then that area is not small relative to the range. And recall, as I pointed out before, that the radar range equation requires that the dimensions of the scattering object be small relative to those distances. So in this case, this statement is not true. And it's not true even if the distance also goes to infinity. So one has to be careful. So now since I brought it up, you could ask the question, what happens if the area does go to infinity? In other words, if you can't use the radar range equation, then what can you do? Well, here in this diagram is an example of a case where the scattering object is infinite in extent. It's a flat, planar, perfectly conducting surface. And everything else here is the same. We have the same transmit power, the same transmit directivity, the same direction of incidence, the same distance, the same r hat sub s, the same range r sub s, the same received directivity, and now we want to know what that power is. And it's very simple to compute simply using image theory. Image theory tells us that we have the exact same scenario going on here if we replace that flat plate with free space and then flip this thing up into the upper half space. Well, if that's the case, then we can use the free space freeze equation. So image theory tells us that in this case with the infinite flat plate, the Received power would be P sub T times G sub T times G sub R. And then wavelength divided by 4 pi total path length quantity squared. There are, of course, other ways you can think about this. Another way to think about this is that the wavefront curvature is being preserved at point Q. In other words, if you have a certain wavefront curvature at this point, Q, 
then that wavefront curvature is preserved on reflection. And that gives you the same result as image theory. Suffice it to say, the RCS concept, that is the radar range equation, does not apply in this case. It does not apply because you cannot possibly interpret the overall size of the scattering structure to be small compared to the ranges. This particular scenario is an example of what's known as specular reflection. Specular reflection means that the scattering characteristics are completely determined by the surface normal, by the wavefront curvature, and by the material properties at just one point, that is at point Q. In other words, in this previous problem, everything we need to know to compute the reflected power back towards the receiver is determined by what's going on at this one point Q. Even though the surface is infinite, all we need to know is what's going on at point Q to know what the received power is, specifically the surface normal, the surface curvature, which here is flat, and the material properties here being perfectly conducting. Now you might ask, well, what point are we referring to, this point Q? Well, point Q is known as a stationary phase point. Undergraduates in electrical engineering are taught that this is a solution to Snell's law. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. That is a geometrical interpretation of this concept of a stationary phase point. Yet another way to think about it, which is more prevalent in physics, is that Q is given by Fermat's law, which says that in optical scattering, path is that which minimizes the total path length. These statements are really three equivalent statements. Uh, they just have different terms and they come from different interpretations of what's happening in the scenario. The concept of specular reflection is frequently misunderstood and this leads to some severe errors. To try to untangle this or to try to bring some order to this, these different interpretations, consider the following summary. So I have three cases here. The first one on the left is the one that we consider at the beginning. So we have some scattering object. Its maximum dimensions are much, much less than the incident and scattered ranges. We see that that then is described by the radar range equation, either bistatic or monostatic. Monostatic being simply a special case of the bistatic radar range equation. This applies to distant targets, as in radar. This also applies to the individual elements in a reflect array. So if you are familiar with the concept of a reflect array, you know that a reflect array consists of many low gain elements comprising a, an array, and the purpose of those elements is to scatter power. And that is certainly a case where the maximum dimension of the scattering objects, that is the elements, is small compared to the ranges. So each element in a reflect array scatters according to this paradigm. The second case we considered was an infinite surface. In that case, we know that the reflection is given by specular reflection. Q is determined by Snell's law or Fermat's law, whichever you care for. The examples where this applies are, for example, ground bounce. When you have two antennas over some ground, such as the Earth, and uh, you can treat that as a specular reflection case. Why? Because there, the scattering, the, that is the reflection, will be determined completely by the properties at one point, namely the point Q given by Snell's law. Other cases where this shows up are, for example, ionospheric reflection can be modeled in this way. A third example is electromagnetic modal fields. These are the kinds of fields that you see in waveguides and in microstrip lines. Neither of those two things are infinite, but they can be described in terms of superpositions of fields which individually behave in this manner. So there are uh, a whole range of applications where the specular reflection paradigm applies in finite scattering things, namely in the description of propagation and waveguides and microstrip lines when you think of them in terms of being superpositions of these modal fields. The third case to consider is this one. In this case, we have 
a structure whose dimensions are much, much greater than the wavelength in every dimension. And perhaps those dimensions are not much bigger than the incident and scattered ranges. However, the surface is curved or is terminated in such a way that the scattering arising from the edges, which we refer to as diffraction, is weak. And there are many cases in which this happens, where we have an electrically large surface, a surface which is many, many wavelengths across, and is terminated in such a way that the diffraction, due to the termination of that surface, is relatively weak. If that's the case, then this looks a lot like this, at least approximately. So we say we have approximately specular reflection in this case, but again, only if these two conditions, electrically large and weak diffraction, apply. Examples where this shows up are, for example, scattering from buildings at frequencies at UHF and above. So one wavelength at 300 megahertz is one meter, and the diffraction from the corners of buildings is typically pretty weak. So buildings might be something that can be well described as specular reflection, or not, depending on the level of accuracy you require from this calculation. Another example that falls into this third case would be large plate reflectors, which are close to the receiver transmitter. So if you simply have a plate, and even if you do have strong diffraction from the edges, but the edges are far from the receiver, and the specular component is much, much stronger, in that case, you may be able to model this as pure specular reflection. But in all of these cases, it's only an approximation. That concludes this lecture on scattering from discrete objects and surfaces.